जय And now chapter 7, The Descendants of King Mandata. Shukdev Goswami said, The most prominent among the sons of Mandata was he who is celebrated as Ambarish. Ambarish was accepted as son by his grandfather, Yuvanashva. Ambarish's son was Yuvanashva, and Yuvanashva's son was Harita. In Mandata's dynasty, Ambarish, Harita, and Yuvanashva were very prominent. The serpent brothers of Narmada gave Narmada to Purukutsa. Being sent by Vasuki, she took Purukutsa to the lower region of the universe. There in Rasatala, the lower region of the universe, Purukutsa, being empowered by Lord Vishnu, was able to kill all the Gandharvas who deserved to be killed. Purukutsa received the benediction from the serpents that anyone who remembers this history of his being brought by Narmada to the lower region of the universe will be assured of safety from the attack of snakes. The son of Purukutsa was Trasadasyu, who was the father of Anaranya. Anaranya's son was Haryashva, the father of Praruna. Praruna was the father of Tribandana. The son of Tribandana was Satyavrata, who is celebrated by the name Trishanku. Because he kidnapped the daughter of a Brahmin when she was being married, his father cursed him to become a Chandala, lower than a Shudra. Thereafter, by the influence of Vishvamitra, he went to the higher planetary system, the heavenly planets, in his material body. But because of the prowess of the demigods, he fell back downward. Nonetheless, by the power of Vishvamitra, he did not fall all the way down. Even today, he can still be seen hanging in the sky, head downward. The son of Trishanku was Harish Chandra. Because of Harish Chandra, there was a quarrel between Vishvamitra and Vasishta, who for many years fought one another, having been transformed into birds. Harish Chandra had no son and was therefore extremely morose. Once, therefore, following the advice of Nadid, he took shelter of Varuna and said to him, My lord, I have no son. Would you kindly give me one? O King Pariksit, Harish Chandra begged Varuna, my Lord, if a son is born to me, with that son I shall perform a sacrifice for your satisfaction. When Harish Chandra said this, Varuna replied, Let it be so. Because of Varuna's benediction, Harish Chandra begot a son named Rohita. Thereafter, when the child was born, Varuna approached Harish Chandra and said, Now you have a son. With this son you can offer me a sacrifice. In answer to this, Harish Chandra said, After ten days have passed since an animal's birth, the animal becomes fit to be sacrificed. After ten days, Varuna came again and said to Harish Chandra, Now you can perform the sacrifice. Harish Chandra replied, When an animal grows teeth, then it becomes pure enough to be sacrificed. When the teeth grew, Varuna came and said to Harish Chandra, now the animal has grown teeth, and you can perform the sacrifice. Harish Chandra replied, When all its teeth have fallen out, then it will be fit for sacrifice. When the teeth had fallen out, Varuna returned and said to Harish Chandra, 
Now the animal's teeth have fallen out and you can perform the sacrifice. But Harishchandra replied, When the animal's teeth grow in again, then he will be pure enough to be sacrificed. When the teeth grew in again, Varuna came and said to Harishchandra, Now you can perform the sacrifice. But Harishchandra then said, O king, when the sacrificial animal becomes a kshatriya and is able to shield himself to fight with the enemy, then he will be purified. Haris Chandra was certainly very much attached to his son. Because of this affection, he asked the demigod Varuna to wait. Thus Varuna waited and waited for the time to come. Rohita could understand that his father intended to offer him as the animal for sacrifice. Therefore, just to save himself from death, he equipped himself with bow and arrows and went to the forest. When Rohita heard that his father had been attacked by dropsy due to Varuna and that his abdomen had grown very large, he wanted to return to the capital, but King Indra forbade him to do so. King Indra advised Rohita to travel to different pilgrimage sites and holy places, for such activities are pious indeed. Following this instruction, Rohita went to the forest for one year. In this way, at the end of the second, third, fourth, and fifth years, when Rohita wanted to return to his capital, the king of heaven, Indra, approached him as an old Brahmin and forbade him to return, repeating the same words as in the previous year. Thereafter, in the sixth year, after wandering in the forest, Rohita returned to the capital of his father. He purchased from Ajigarta his second son, named Shunashepa. Then he offered Shunashepa to his father, Harishchandra, to be used as the sacrificial animal, and offered Harishchandra his respectful obeisances. Thereafter, the famous King Harishchandra, one of the exalted persons in history, performed grand sacrifices by sacrificing a man and pleased all the demigods. In this way, his dropsy, created by Varuna, was cured. In that great human sacrifice, Vishvamitra was the chief priest to offer oblations. The perfectly self-realized Jamadagni had the responsibility for chanting the mantras from the Yajurveda, Vasishta was the chief Brahminical priest, and the sage Ayasya was the reciter of the hymns of the Sam Veda. King Indra, being very pleased with Harishchandra, offered him a gift of a golden chariot. Soon Ashepa's glories will be presented along with the description of the son of Vishvamitra. The great sage Vishvamitra saw that Maharaj Harish Chandra, along with his wife, was truthful, forbearing, and concerned with the essence. Thus he gave them imperishable knowledge for fulfillment of the human mission. Maharaj Harish Chandra first purified his mind, which was full of material enjoyment, by amalgamating it with the earth. Then he amalgamated the earth with water the water with fire, the fire with the air, and the air with the sky. Thereafter, he amalgamated the sky with the total material energy, and the total material energy with spiritual knowledge. This spiritual knowledge is realization of one's self as part of the Supreme Lord. When the self-realized spiritual soul is engaged in service to the Lord, he is eternally imperceptible and inconceivable. Thus established in spiritual knowledge, he is completely freed from material bondage. Thus ends the seventh chapter of the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Descendants of King Mandata.